Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this tutorial. This tutorial is going to be more about the fundamentals and we're going to be looking at some graphs that I've made up to try to give you a better understanding of how Stingray structures its materials. And this is going to be really important as we move along because not understanding how it's structured uh, will really get, put you at a disadvantage. Uh, and I want to give you guys the advantage to really understand how we structure the material system in Stingray because if you understand it, you can leverage it to great extent. You can make much more efficient projects, which means that you're going to have less memory usage on the card or less computational power. And, you know, by doing that, that means you're going to have bigger levels with more stuff in them. And you'll be able to just make a more efficient project, especially for things like VR, where, you know, performance is absolutely critical. You're going to have a big advantage here by understanding materials. If you don't understand it and you're just using, like, the standard shader with standard inputs, um, it's wonderful, it's, it's fine, but you are going to hit limits. And I want to take those limits away from you so when you do encounter problems, you know how to resolve them. And it'll also allow you to do things like material swapping and all sorts of different things that you just wouldn't know how to do if you didn't truly understand the material system. So uh, that's what I'm going to be focusing on in this specific section of this tutorial series. Uh, this is going to be on the fundamentals of uh, materials. And in order to really get at the fundamentals, we have to understand the structure. So that's where we're going to begin. And uh, as you can see on my screen right here, I've got this uh, simple chart uh, that is what we think, okay? And I think, I mean, maybe you, maybe you know more, but for the, for the vast majority of people, I believe, uh, when they come into 3D or game development, this is kind of the structure that they think or that we think um, a, a project is constructed like, right? We're going to have our project. Underneath the project, we're going to have a level, right? In that level, we're going to have some units, and the units are going to have materials that are applied, and then um, underneath the materials are going to be the actual textures. Uh, some people may even think that we don't even have this materials container, right? We just have Stingray project, levels, units, and textures, right? Um, but, but that's just not the case, okay? And there's a reason why we don't have this as the case, because this would be extremely linear, right? It could theoretically work, but if you think about it, if, if a unit is always containing a material and the material is always containing the texture, then what you're going to have is the inability to be able to put like different textures on different materials or the same texture on different materials or different materials onto different units, right? So we could, we could make, in theory, there's no way we could have like one material that is applied to several units this way, right? Because it just wouldn't really work. So what we have is a little bit more of a complex system, okay? And I'm going to move to that now, all right? And this is really what it's set up like, okay? This is actually how Stingray structures it. Um, it's a little more complex, but you're going to notice that a lot of the things are the same, but there are some in-betweens that allow us a lot of power, okay? So let's start from the top, right? We have our Stingray project. We have our level or levels, right? We have units. We have meshes, right? The meshes are within our units. The mesh slots are basically containers that are going to hold our materials. The material has texture slots, and the textures go into those texture slots. And then our samples are what go into the textures. So this one's a little confusing um, because you might think, like, why do I need anything beyond the texture? Well, the texture is really not technically a texture. It's what we call a texture. But the texture is going to have a sample. The sample is your actual image resource, right? But the texture is going to be the instructions on how to do things like compression and things like that. So generally speaking, we can almost consider the texture and the sample as one because we're not really going to deal with samples individually, right? We, we just won't. We're going to import our sample. We're going to give it some instructions, and then it's just going to be our texture. So that's why it's set up like this. But it is important to understand that the texture is not actually the image. The texture is the instructions and the image, okay? So that's, that's really critical, okay? And we'll, we'll understand that later um, down the road when I get to things like compression and when we want to set it up for things like, um, you know, iOS and Android and you know, any other platforms that we want to go to, the texture is what's going to be holding those instructions for our texture sample, 
okay? So that's, that's a little more detailed than I wanted to get to right now, but that's the idea, okay? So let's actually see how this looks in a project, okay? In a project, this is what it's gonna kind of feel like, all right? Now, let's just kind of understand what's going on here, right? It looks complicated, but I promise you it's not very complicated. What we have is our Stingray project, right? The Stingray project has the possibilities of having level one and level two. We could have level three, four, five, and six, but for this example, we're just gonna have a very simple example, okay? So we've got level one and we've got our um, units here, okay? So this, this level has three units, this level has three units as well. But let's notice just here, right? So this one is gonna have one unit that is a table and two units that are chairs. Okay, so this one is one table, two chairs. Okay, so then the, the unit of table is going to have some meshes or a single mesh in this case, right? So this mesh is gonna have two material slots, right? One for dark wood and one for light wood, right? So now our dark wood is gonna have its material, right? It's the material instruction set of dark wood, right? And it's gonna have some instructions. And in those instructions are gonna be some texture slots. And those texture slots are gonna be our dark wood color. And here you'll see that we're gonna go down to this wood normal. Notice that it's not dark wood normal, okay? It's just wood normal, okay? And here we have our wood RMA, okay? So this is just another image sample. So these are feeding this texture slot or the, feeding into these texture slots and those texture slots are part of this material uh, instruction set. And that material instruction set is now feeding our meshes material slots, okay? So that structure allows us to now say, because we don't have just a material applied directly, we have this material slot. What we have now is the ability to have another object, right? Our unit chair has the mesh chair body and the material instruction that has a text, a material slot. And that material slot, if you notice, is feeding also into wood dark, okay? So now wood dark is feeding one uh, unit and another unit. So two units are making use of one material. Isn't that nice, right? So that gives us this amazing amount of power that we're not linear, right? There's no linearity here, right? We can basically apply one material to multiple uh, material slots, because a material slot is literally just a material slot. Any of these materials could be applied. If we wanted to, we could put material leather into this material slot, right? It wouldn't matter. It would be okay. Um, and it would take on the instructions, which would then tell, okay, now I've got this texture slots, what are, what's applied to those texture slots, and it would just read whatever's in the texture slots. So this structure gives us a vast amount of capability especially in the terms of savings. Now, if these were all linear, right, we'd have one line here that would lead to its textures, which would have three textures within this one, right, because we have three texture slots. So we're gonna have three textures on this guy. We're gonna have three textures on this guy, three textures on this guy, three textures on this guy, three textures on this guy. Now, and that's, that's just assuming we have three texture slots. If we had more texture slots, it would be even worse, right? But now we've got all those texture slots, each one of them being uniquely filled that's a lot of memory, right? Tons of memory we're wasting right there. Tons of instructions that we're wasting right there. They're all redundant. They're all doing the same kinds of things. So why do we want to have that redundancy? We don't, right? So instead what we want to do is make sure that we have this ability to share resources. And that's really the, the crux of it all, right? Is that we want to share resources, okay? So this concept allows us to, to share those resources. And by sharing the resources, we reduce memory, we reduce instruction cost, we reduce so many different things. And that is really gonna give us a lot of leverage and a lot of power as we move forward, okay? So this is very hard to understand because it's really ethereal. You're looking at a graph and it's like, what does this have to do with my project, right? So let's jump into a project and take a look and see how this plays out in an actual project. Okay, so here we are in Stingray, and as you can see, I've got the graph that we were just working with on the left. And I'm doing that so that we can go ahead and relate, you know, the Stingray project to this graph over here so you can better understand the exact structure, okay? So what do we have, right? We have a scene, and this one's going to be just like scene one or level one, right? And 
That level is within a project called uh, tutorial, Material Tutorial Project, and we're looking at level one. So that's basically what we're seeing up here. We have our Stingray project, which is this right here, and we have our level one, which is this right here, right? So we're inside of level one, and we're looking at level one, okay? And inside of level one, we have a table, and we have two chairs, right? And over here, we have one table and two chairs, right? So this is exactly a one-to-one. -one. Now, inside of our, uh, our table, we have two materials. We have this light wood and we have this dark wood, right? And in our chairs, we have our dark wood, our light wood, and our leather, right? So let's take a look at how that relates over here. So we have our unit table and it has a mesh, right? That uh, has some material slots, right? So those material slots are gonna be the dark wood and the light wood, right? So here is the dark wood and the light wood. And in our chair, right, we have uh, two meshes, right? So this mesh is gonna be basically broken into this leather pad and the wood chair itself. The wood chair has the material slots of dark wood and light wood, right? And it, the, the mesh of the cushion has the leather material, okay? So there we can see the basic breakdown of our unit structure and how this is constructed there. Now, when we look in the uh, asset list here, notice that I don't have multiple dark woods or multiple light woods. I only have one dark and one light and one leather. So I have three materials right here, just as we have three materials right here, okay? So these are the instruction sets. And if we double click on these instruction sets, we can go ahead and take a look at how they're constructed. So I just have to bring up my properties panel. So I'm just gonna go Windows, Property Editor. So here's the Property Editor. And as you can see, well, the properties of this material have some slots, right? We have this color map, we have this normal map, and we have an RMA map. And those are these texture slots, okay? We also have some other variables that we can adjust, but I'm not gonna get into those right now. Uh, those are gonna be more down the road um, when we start dealing with uh, the next layers of this tutorial series, okay? Uh, but for now, let's just understand we have these three slots, right? And in those slots are applied a texture, right? And those textures are located right here, okay? So if we open up the textures folder, we can see our different textures. Now, just as we have a texture dark wood color, we have a texture dark wood color, right? We have a texture wood light color, we have a texture wood light color. We have you know, the leather color, here's our leather color. Now here's our shared ones, right? So we have this wood normal and this wood RMA, here's our wood RMA and wood normal. So if we go back to this folder, we can kind of take a quick look and see that wood dark material has this dark base color, wood normal, wood RMA. Now if I look at the light, we'll see that the only thing that changed was this wood light base color, okay? These two are both being shared, right? So these are no longer requiring us to import a new map for each of those slots because these are just going to be shared. They don't need to be um, recreated and they don't need to be re-imported and they don't need to take up more memory. So this is the kind of idea that I'm trying to stress here is that we can really increase performance and memory usage uh, just by little tricks like this. They both are basically the same. So why not just use the same normal and the same RMA map, right? So, so that's what this is allowing us. Now, let's go back into the textures for a quick second. And as we can see here, we have this texture, but we also have a sample underneath. Now, as I was telling you, that the textures are what we generally are gonna use, right? The samples are kind of one-to-one -one with these textures. But I just wanna show you that we can see those if we go show all files. We can see that we have our uh, actual PNG file, which is part of this uh, textures instruction set. Now, if we want to edit that instruction set, all we do is just double click on the texture and that'll bring up the texture manager. Inside the texture manager is where we set our instructions, okay? So here are the properties or instructions that we're giving to this texture, right? So I could say I want to, um, let's say, put a different compression on it, right? So I can change the compression here, right? Or I can uh, go into these options and we can just look at windows, right? So here's our instructions for different platforms, okay? So we're just going to look at windows for now. And when I do, I can see that this is now set to DXT1 compression, but I could change that. Let's say I knew I needed to have this 
uh, be a transparent, right? So then I could set this to DXT uh, 5 or I could set this to RGB um, 8. You know, I could do a lot of different things in here, right? But this is how we set our main instructions for our textures. Now, once these instructions are set, like I said, they're one to one with the actual sample, which is underneath. So we don't generally have to look at this. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that back off again. But this is how we are dealing with uh, those texture samples and why it's called a texture um, and why those are, are not just directly the sample, right? Because they do have instructions in them and we do need to be able to edit those instructions. Now, back up again, let's take a look at our material. And here we can see that we have these material slots, but we're not necessarily sure where those material slots come from. Right? So we need to be able to adjust these material slots for different types of shaders, right? If we want to create a shader that doesn't use RMA, but instead uses roughness and a metallic and an ambient, right? And we want to have them all separated. We need to be able to do that, right? So how are we going to do that? Well, if we go here, open shader graph. So here we can go ahead and take a look at the shader graph, right? And each of these are our samples, okay? And if you look over here, you'll see that we have some basic concepts of what these slots are gonna hold, right? So here is your basic sample, and we have the encoding, which is gonna be sRGB, which is just the way that the, the image is coming in, right? So color maps are generally gonna be sRGB. Um, you have your address mode and your filter mode. Um, so these are just basic settings for this slot. Right? So when we put a texture in here, it's going to read it properly. Okay? Now, we can um, create new slots by just going Add, Sampling, and Sample Texture. Okay? And this will give us a new sample texture. So now, this is just called Sample Texture. If I unselect, we can see that we have a new texture slot here. This isn't doing anything yet but we can instruct it to do things, okay? So I don't wanna get into this. We're gonna, we're gonna go through this in later parts of this tutorial. I just wanted to show you how these slots get created, okay? And that's why we have texture slots, right? Or sample slots. These are really important because they're gonna allow us to be extremely creative in the way that we do our shader design, okay? And this is gonna be very important as we move down the road in general, okay? Because we can make shaders that do vastly cool things. And we're going to need lots of different texture samples to be able to do that. Um, but that's the basics, okay? So um, I think that's pretty much going to conclude this tutorial. Um, and in the next one, we're going to probably start going into the shader graph a little more detailed. So I'm going to show you how to construct your own basic shader graph uh, so you can start from scratch. And you will be able to create your own shader graphs with ease by the time we're done with this. And I'm going to go you know, step by step through all the different little nodes that we have in that shader graph. So if we go here, um, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff in here to explore. And the, the whole idea behind this series is to kind of go through each of these things and give you a better understanding of what they do and how to put them to use. Okay, so, um, but that's going to conclude this fundamentals tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope this gives you a better understanding of Stingray materials in the long run. Okay, um, thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.